oil palm. Millions of hectares are planted in coconut palm, and one ends up being nice and the other one ends up being evil, translating into kind of the social media um, text that I, I, I pasted a, um, an example here below, what bollocks discharged from filthy pro palm oil IUCN. IUCN is the largest conservation organization in the world who back corrupt RSPO, the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, um, and who is chaired by no other than fraud Mayat of the RSPO. This is very typical of the kind of um, media attention I get in my work around vegetable oils. And it's a good starting point because it shows us how polarized this world is. And one of the reasons it's it's polarized, um, or especially one of the reasons why palm oil is seen as, as such an evil and bad crop is the link to the orangutan. Uh, photos like this where uh, land clearing is happening and orangutans are being uh, rescued in a process of, of land clearing because they're losing their habitats. They have kind of set the scene for what people think about palm oil. And to be very clear, uh, palm oil has had a major negative impact on orangutan conservation. But what we sort of forget in that discussion is that all um, means of fat production have a, a negative environmental impact. And by focusing on one, we tend to forget about the other. So what I'm looking for is this more nuanced discussion about oils and fats and what they mean to the environment. And uh, it's not just what it means to the environment. Of course, what we consume uh, affects our health and uh, affects our need for, for nutrition. And even there, I find that the world is very confused about the, the good and the bad oils. I just picked randomly two examples of um, the best cooking oils to, uh, to use and one points out sunflower and um, canola oil or rapeseed oil and corn oil as okay. And the next one I pick up says, these are ones that need to be ditched um, because they're unsaturated, uh, they're not good for you, and instead you should be cook, uh, cooking with, with coconut. I mean, who knows anything about these things and what concrete information do we have? Now, I'm not a, a health specialist, neither am I a nutritional specialist. So I won't, I won't touch on this so much, but there seems to be one huge unclarity about impacts on ourselves and on the planet of the production of different fats and oils. And um, there also seems to be a need among consumers to understand this better because these are things that we consume on a daily basis. And if we care a little bit about ourselves and if we care a little bit about the planet, we would like to know what the relative impacts are of different choices of choosing animal fat versus vegetable oils, um, of choosing, let's say, palm oil versus coconuts versus corn oil and so on. What are the consequences of that for ourselves and the planet? So it does raise some interesting questions. And these questions are not. Um, not simple um, because you're you're quite often dealing with among others as I mentioned health and nutrition but also others um, such as labor and, and income in uh, countries in the world that produce oils and fats people make a living from that farming and sometimes this especially in the tropics this happens in areas of high poverty rates and the opportunity of a farmer to produce palm oil or coconut oil um, may be able, may allow him, um, him or her to send their children to, to school. Um, how does that weigh up against the impact of oil palm on uh, the survival likelihood of, of an orangutan? Uh, we have issues of land rights, issues of environment, and also, as I will discuss, issues of yield and, and land needs. And all that forms this great complexity of interacting different goals. Now, these goals... I've picked out here the um, the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals that includes things like reducing poverty, uh, poverty reducing hunger, uh, improving health and well-being, education, gender equality, but also environmental uh, objectives such as uh, reducing the impacts of climate change by by reducing carbon emissions from deforestation, uh, protecting protected um, or endangered species. Um, protecting the seas and so on. And sometimes we seem to assume that we can have it all, 
But when you realize or when you look down in more detail on the ground, you realize that there are trade-offs between different objectives that we can't have it all and we need to choose. And that, that creates a lot of complexity around choices that uh, choices that are all ultimately down to what you as a consumer uh, choose to consume or not. Um, maybe just taking a step back. I mean, fats are, fats are important. Fats are, um, of course, an important source of, of energy. Uh, a healthy diet is said to require about 27.5% um, fat. Uh, fats are also essential. They're, they're essential parts of cell membranes. We, we need fats and, and, and humans have been dubbed the fat hunters. Um, we're chasing after fat for particular needs, um, including some of the essential fats, some of the fats that, um, um, that help us, um, uh, use particular vitamins like A and D and, uh, and K, for example. Um, so we're after fats. Um, and of course, a lot of us have way too much fat. Uh, that's why there's 1.9 billion people on the planet that are considered overweight that could probably do with certainly some redu uh, reduced consumption in fats as well as sugars, of course. Uh, but on the other hand of the scale, there is the uh, nearly 1 billion people that are undernourished where um, increased fat consumption as well as increased consumption of carbohydrates um, and so on and proteins um, is probably part of the a solution to reduce under an nourishment. And this all happens, of course, in a situation where the human population on our planet is still growing at a quite high rate. Um, more people require more food, therefore require more fat, and we need to somehow work out how we're going to meet those, um, those fat needs. And the uncertainties, as you see in this graph, for future population size vary quite a bit. At some stage, it will stabilize, but nevertheless, whichever the, the point of stabilization is, we know that by 2050 or 2070, we need to produce more oils and fats to feed all the people and the dogs in the world. Um, this has been um, termed closing the, um, the fat gap. Um, we currently have about, uh, we're about 45 million tons short in the required fat intake to uh, to meet that that level that I mentioned earlier of, of a healthy uh, diet consisting 27.5% uh, of, um, of fat. And that fat gap will uh, or is projected to increase as there are more mouths to feed into the future, requ requiring an additional um, 88 to 139 million tons of, of fats. Um, against the current production of, of about 268, most of which is from plants. So soybean is a major producer, palm oil, as you see in this graph, sunflower, rapeseed oil, or canola, uh, groundnuts or peanuts, uh, other oils. And then the remainder is um, from, from animal fats that, of course, indirectly depends on, on crops. I mean, animals are fed on soybean, on, on rapeseeds, among others. So the production of animal fats requires the growth of, of plants as well. So somehow that demand is going to go up and somehow we need to meet that demand to ensure that people aren't going hungry. How does that play out um, on the, in the world? Well, here's, here are some maps to, um, to show where people are severely undernourished. Unsurprisingly, this plays out in uh, large parts of Africa, uh, Democratic, uh, Democratic Re Republic of Congo, uh, countries um, south and east of that, to a certain extent also in South America and to a certain extent in uh, Southeast and South Asia, um, there is a need to increase food intake. For example, in Haiti, this is um, requ uh, there's a requirement to increase the number of kilocalories per person per day by 530. In Zambia, it was 405. The Central African Republic, 380. North Korea, 343. And as I said earlier, um, the other side of that discussion is the overconsumption of um, uh, things that make us fat and obese, uh, which includes fats, um, which plays out especially in the in the global north, um, the United States, Canada, uh, large parts of Europe, Australia, and also large parts of South America. So there is this kind of double um, double sided. 
discussion around meeting uh, meeting needs for fat, but also reducing consumption of fat in other parts of the uh, the world. Uh, if we then look at these same countries and look at what kind of fats are being primarily consumed, I pointed out earlier um, the consumption of uh, or the need, the undernourishment in Central Africa. We can see here those countries, colored in brown, where groundnut oil is a key, a key oil, uh, palm oil is a key oil. In other parts of the world, Southeast Asia, again, palm oil is a key oil. In South Asia, India, more reliance on soybean oil. Uh, South America, strongly reliant on soybean oil, as well as uh, North America and Canada, strongly reliant on rapeseeds, um, canola and mustard oil. So there are these different oil, dominant oils that are consumed that are related to both undernourishment and overconsumption of fats and oils and related obesity. So I think this is interesting to explore these um, these geographic patterns and see uh, what that means for increasing fat production as well as reducing the negative impacts from overconsumption of, uh, of fats. Now, one thing that's also important to keep in mind, especially when you're talking about uh, poor people with a, a poverty uh, the poverty line currently at around one one uh, US dollar ninety per day. So people that have one dollar ninety per day to spend or less are considered poor, and for them it becomes quite an important uh, consideration about the cost of increasing their energy intakes. And one thing about fats is fats are relatively cheap, as you see here, the cost per person per day by different food um, food groups, including fats and vegetables and fruits and dairy and protein-rich foods, um, fats are relatively cheap. And uh, for people that haven't got much to spend, it is important to consider where am I going to spend the few cents that I'm making every day, what kind of foods. And I'd be the last one to recommend that people primarily eat fats because, of course, then you go from a, um, a poverty-induced undernourishment into a poverty-induced obesity problem if you don't have a balanced diet. So this is not about just increasing consumption of fats, but fats are part of that step up from first an energy sufficient diet where you or people meet their uh, energetic requirements through intake of protein, uh, rich foods and carbohydrates and fats. And then uh, a nutrient uh, adequate diet that ensures that all the uh, the food that you eat also meets all our nutritional requirements and then ultimately a healthy diet that is uh, fully balanced on, uh, across all the food crops uh, groups. It is important here that we look at the, the cost and affordability uh, of, of healthy diets. And one aspect that I will touch on is the, uh, the, the importance of transportation co costs of foods. Ideally, especially for poor people, you consume the fats that are locally produced because that means there are no additional transportation costs or fewer um, additional transportation costs, making it cheaper for you to uh, to buy, therefore increasing the likelihood that you can improve the quality of your diet. Just to see how that works out a little bit across the world, this is the uh, maps of the proportion of people that are unable to afford each level of, of diet quality. So I had earlier these steps from energy sufficient to nutrient adequate to healthy diets and each of those come with different different costs at the top the the percentage of people who cannot afford an energy sufficient diet which is um it's pretty low across the world only in africa do these levels go up but then the percentage of people who cannot afford either a nutritional a nutritionally adequate diet or a healthy diet is going up much more to nearly 100% in large parts of Africa for the third category. So it is important then to look at the cost of food production and the food cost of food transportation to ensure that food prices are cheap enough for people that need it most can actually afford better diets. Now, what does that mean in terms of the role of fats and oils for meeting people's nutritional and health requirements now and in the future without incurring additional environmental impacts. And that's kind of a, uh, a thing I want to explore in this second part of the presentation. I'm introducing here a, a concept that's been around for a while. It's also been criticized for a, 
by, by quite a lot of people. It's this idea of planetary boundaries. Um, a group of scientists have sat down and looked at a number of, of variables, including land system change and freshwater use and the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen that goes into our environments, ocean acidification, atmospheric aerosol loading, ozone depletion in the, uh, the stratosphere, novel entities that haven't been quantified yet, as well as climate change and biodiversity. And in a lot of these, agriculture plays a, a major role. So these, these planetary boundaries are set with the idea that once we, we go beyond that boundary, things are start, starting to go weird. Um, we may encounter planetary tipping points where we mess up the system so much that it ends up being something entirely different from what it was before, possibly unable to sustain uh, human societies as they, they were. This is called uh, the boundaries are setting the safe operat operating space for the environment. So broken down in different um, components, especially biosphere integrity, land system change, and biochemical flows have been exceeded. So this deals with biodiversity, this deals with loss of tropical rainforests and other natural ecosystems, and also the vast amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that ends up in our environments, our waterways, and are undermining uh, the environmental stability. And this is a real concern. Now, whether these tipping points and these boundaries really exist, I'm not going to mix in that discussion right now, but we can see that we are way beyond patterns of stability for issues like biodiversity. Biodiversity losses are in an order of magnitude that we haven't seen for, uh, for tens of millions of, of years. So something big is going on and something highly concerning is going on. And for, for someone like myself, who's spent much of the past 30 years working on the conservation of species like orangutans, I know something really bad is going on and we're, we're losing species like that very, very rapidly. Um, now, the way that plays out is um, um, things like biospheres, biosphere integrity, the undermining of the integrity of ecological systems. Um, relatively safe parts are in the uh, the Arctic and, and, and in the tropics where change hasn't really, agricultural, ag agriculturally driven change hasn't really pushed these systems to the boundaries. Um, freshwater use in, in dry parts of the world like the, the Western United States, South Asia, uh, around the Mediterranean in Europe and Northern Africa, um, parts of China, Mongolia and so, and so on are really challenged with regards to the access to fresh water that feeds the agriculture that a lot of these densely populated parts of the planet um, require to survive. Uh, similarly, nitrogen flows, uh, high problems in the, um, the central United States because of the strong focus on agricultural production, very large parts of Europe, um, very large parts of Eastern Asia, as well as South Asia. So there are some important areas of concern of high risk for trespassing these planetary boundaries. Now, all that might, might sound like, ah, we're seriously screwed here. We can't do anything anymore. Um, luckily, the, 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 the scientists that are working on this see a way out of this. Um, if we're just trying to meet future food needs to feed all those extra mouths that are going to be on Earth um, in the next 30 years or so, um, we can't just do that by uh, trying to stay within within the boundaries. We need fundamental changes in the way we irrigate and fertilize and use our crops for producing uh, the food and the fat that we need, uh, the way we use and manage water and nutrients and, and land. Uh, food losses, food waste is a huge part of it. Um, large uh, percentages of our food never gets eaten. Uh, gets thrown out or doesn't even make it to the supermarkets and the markets where we buy our food. Um, and then dietary change. It's very clear that um, diets that heavily rely on intake of animal foods are environmentally much more problematic than those that rely on, uh, uh, on, on vegetables. So taking all these steps into consideration, it seems to be possible to feed up to 10 billion people without um, trespassing these, these planetary boundaries. But it will require major change. And part of that change is our thinking around, okay, which, which fats and oils are we going to use in the future? Again, 
for the sake of our own health and nutrition, but also for the sake of the planet that we all share. Um, in that respect, I think it's pretty clear that the environmental footprint of animal fats is much larger than that of, um, of edible oils. Um, I, I used some graphs in, from the study published last year uh, titled The Roles of Fats in the Transition of Sustainable Diets that looked at, uh, among others, the, the carbon footprint, the biodiversity footprint, the land footprint, and the blue water footprint of um, different sources of oil and fat, including soybean, palm oil, uh, rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, wheat, and peanut oil uh, on the plant side, um, and then pork, large uh, dairy, um, poultry, beef, tallow, eggs on the animal side. And almost across all these categories, if you look at the different scale bars on the, on the, the, the left that stand for kilograms of carbon dioxide associated with the production of one kilo of fat through, for example, beef, which is about 400 kilograms, as opposed to those for soybean and palm oil, which is about five. So we're talking 80 size, smaller, 80 times size, 80 times uh, smaller footprints for plant sources than for animal sources. Uh, the same for, for biodiversity, where especially beef stands out as having a very large impact on biodiversity. Uh, this plays out in areas like the Amazon, where vast areas of tropical um, Amazonian rainforests have been cut down for the production of the, uh, for cattle grazing and for the production of, of, of meat and animal fats. Uh, the land footprint in terms of the square meters of land required to produce one kilo of fat, again, is significantly higher for dairy and beef compared to equivalent plant sources. And finally, um, the strongest difference seems to be for blue water, where dairy requires about 16,000 liters of water to produce one kilogram, uh, kilogram of fat, uh, whereas um, crops like soybean and palm oil, it's almost negligible. So there are some major environmental considerations as to what source of fat you're, you're going to choose. And I know some people here have argued for increased intake of animal-based uh, fat for, for health reasons. I, I would just want to say, well, do whatever you want, but have a serious thought about what the environmental impacts are of, of that choice, looking at, for example, studies like, uh, like this one. Now, um, if we look at how this plays out with the, if we, if we agree that the production of fats to oil crops rather than um, uh, animal fats is, is a good idea from an environmental perspective, we need to look again where these oil crops are grown. Uh, this map shows across the earth where the major oil crops are grown with, uh, in purple, rapeseed, that's sort of a higher latitudes uh, crop in colder areas. Um, the northern United States and southern Canada are big producers, large parts of Europe, as well as, uh, as Russia, uh, northern India and China, all, also big producers. Um, in green, um, that's, um, that's sunflower. Uh, in brown, olive. In yellowish here, centered on, uh, on Africa. Those are the big groundnut or peanut production areas. Orange is, uh, is soybean, especially large in northern Argentina, southern Brazil, um, much of the United States, as well as parts of India, uh, Bangladesh, and, uh, and China. Then kind of the, the green is, um, is oil palm, of course, concentrated on the two largest producers of palm oil, which, is, uh, which are Indonesia and, um, and Malaysia, parts of Western Africa. And finally, coconut, which is kind of distributed across the, the tropics, a crop that we often overlook. Um, I'll have a bit more to say about coconut later on. Um, now, one important um, consideration in the choice of, of uh, vegetable oil crops with regards to their environmental impacts is that the yields, so the, the amount of oil that gets produced per unit of area uh, differs a lot. Uh, and this graph recently um, published in, in 2021 um, shows that uh, palm oil is a relatively effective crop um, with high yielding crop producing 36 of the global production of vegetable oils 
on about 8.6% uh, of all land allocated to the production of vegetable oils. Um, for soybean, this is much lower. Soybean is about 20, 25.5% of total production of vegetable oils on 39% of land. And as you go down to these different crops, they become lower, lower yielding. Um, you can also translate that in uh, what would happen if we would try to meet the total demand for vegetable oils through single crops only? Uh, if we use, if we would do this uh, through sesame, eat, or, uh, sesame seed oil only, we'd need about 2 billion hectares, um, which would be larger than the total land area of Canada and the United States combined. Uh, that's not going to happen. I mean, we don't have that amount of land available for the production of, uh, of oil crops. So sesame oil while it may need, um, um, meet certain niche requirements for particular oils or um, um, a lovely Asi Asian dish with, uh, with sesame oil, I, I, like that. I like that too. So for, for taste requirements, but for meeting overall uh, vegetable oil needs in the world, sesame oil is not a good choice. Neither is cotton seed, neither is really um, peanuts. Um, the more productive oil crops are palm oil and sun sunflower seed oil as well as rapeseed, where really palm oil stands out as a highly productive crop, producing much more per hectare than, um, than, than the other oil crops. And to me, the less land we can allocate or need to allocate to meet the future demand for foods and fats, it, the better it is for the environment, because the more we can actually protect for maintaining environmental services and biodiversity and reducing climate change and so on. All very important things to, uh, to think about. Uh, because all these crops have, have impacts. As I said, we tend to talk a lot about the environmental impacts of uh, palm oil production. And, and those impacts are real. I mean, palm oil has driven deforestation. Palm oil has been associate with, associated with increased invasive species. Uh, reduce soil fertility, um, reduction in water quality in fisheries, um, uh, reduce uh, water regulation and supply. Um, palm oil or oil palm development has driven orangutans out of their hab habitats and, and, and re uh, increased human uh, wildlife conflicts, or tiger as well. Um, and there's been a, a range of other factors, environmental factors associated with the production of palm oil. But as I said at the start of my presentation, these exist for all um, oil crops. And we tend to, to only narrow or zoom in into particular crops and then forget about, about others. And I think that is problematic. Because, for example, the biodiversity, uh, the biodiversity impacts of oil production, therefore uh, all crops. We talk about orangutans and, and oil palm, but we don't talk about the... Uh, Chacon Packery and soybean, which soybean takes up 126 million hectares of land, soybean production. Oil palm is about a fifth of that. Um, soybean uh, has displaced huge areas of natural ecosystem in Brazil and northern Argentina, as well as large areas of natural grassland in the United States. And we don't really address or talk about those biodiverse impacts. Peanut expansion is threatening species that occur in tropical rainforest in Africa. Um, cotton expansion is a problem in certain parts of Africa as well. And I've just, just picked out a number of scientific studies that touch on these, but this generally doesn't filter through to, to the media. And again, that coconut, and I, I like picking on coconut, not, sure, not so much because I don't like coconut, I think that's a, that's a beautiful palm, but because of that polarization in the debate uh, we're currently implementing a study uh, mapping all the coconut in the world, and there are large numbers of Pacific islands where the natural vegetation has been 100% wiped out and 100% replaced by coconut, where basically all the original biodiversity has disappeared along with the disappearing of natural ecosystems, and we rarely or ever talk about it. Coconut is an invasive species on islands where uh, environmentalists are trying to actively remove all traces of coconut because it's invading into natural ecosystems, but we don't talk about it. So we need to have that more nuanced discussion and nuanced understanding of the impacts, the, uh, the environmental impacts of all these different uh, crops. Um, and this is important because, uh, as I said earlier, all these crops have impact on, on biodiversity, whether you're talking about 
soybean here on the right, or uh, rapeseed, or oil palm, or cotton. Um, the, the horizontal line um, um, that runs through these graphs indicates the biodiversity, the reference biodiversity of the natural ecosystem that would have occurred before the oil crops took over. And you can see that all these oil crops, of course, have lower biodiversity than what would have been there with, before agriculture came in. And that's logical. Um, environmental or uh, eco ecological systems, ecosystems are natural, uh, complex, naturally complex systems with lots of opportunities for species to, uh, to, to live and breathe and survive. Um, agricultural systems are very simple systems, often uh, consisting of one crop only, and they just don't have that many opportunities for, for species. So species biodiversity in all agricultural systems are lower than the, the reference systems. And then it becomes important to, to really look um, re relatively what the impacts are of these different crops on whatever we care for, whether it's water needs or nitrogen pollution, uh, nitrogen pollution or uh, carbon storage or land needs or biodiversity. So it wouldn't surprise me if, you, if you're currently scratching your head, like, what am I going to make of all this information? So um, we've talked about, like, the, the, the requirements of fat production for meeting people's um, energy needs, especially in people that are currently undernourished, that require certain choices for certain fats and oils that can be produced locally and cheaply, so it doesn't impact negatively on people's budgets. But quite often, these same areas are also problematic from uh, an environmental point of view, especially in the tropics, where large parts of the tropics are still covered in tropical rainforest. And we certainly don't want any of those tropical rainforests to be replaced with production areas for oils and fats. So where does the balance lie? What is good for us? What is best for us that is also best for, for the planet? Now, unfortunately, uh, like you, I am still scratching my head. I mean, there are certain patterns that I, I'm picking up, um, but it, it does re require further, um, further, further study to really start understanding. And ultimately, it is also uh, value driven. If you deeply care about your own health and you don't care about the environment, well, what can I say? I mean, pick the oil and fat that you that works best for you. If you do care both for the environment of the planet, uh, the health of the planet and uh, the health and, and, and nutritional uh, requirements of yourself, then it gets a little uh, a little trickier. But there are some some general uh, patterns to look at. For, first of all, I think there is still a lot of scope for um, for new developments. Um, there is experimentation with microbial fats, uh, fats made from from algae, uh, fats made from insects that might uh, play part in meeting future oil and fat demands. Among the the choice between animal and vegetable fats, uh, vegetable oil, uh, vegetable oil fats are generally better from an environmental perspective because they require less agricultural production. Um, you, you're harvesting the oils directly from the plants rather than feeding the plants into the animals and then harvesting the, uh, the fats from the animals. Uh, the former is more effective. Among those, um, oil palm is a relatively high yielding crop that requires less land than other crops. And then, as I said, it's important to minimize the total land area allocated to um, uh, oil and fat production. <laughs> I think peanut oil is um, is a potential potentially good oil. It's cheap. It's locally produced in tropical areas. <clears throat> Excuse me, where um, where oil and fat needs are really um, high, um, or the needs for closing the fat gap is high, especially to do this cheaply. Um, so I think peanut oil is one that we don't know much about, but I think we need to carefully look into it. Also, how can yields be increased? Um, uh, so we need to, we can minimize the amount of land allocated to, um, uh, to peanut. I think soybean oil is, uh, it's the largest oil crop in, uh, in the world. It will likely remain a leading source of oil, but, <clears throat> but <clears throat> it's also a, a component of animal feed. And I think overall, for us to reduce pork and poultry production and, and consumption, 
um, is important because ultimately it will lead to a reduction in soybean and soybean oil production, which is good in places like South America. Uh, from a health perspective, um, I think we, we all know of the health benefits or we heard of the health benefits of olive oil. There's been discussion about similar uh, benefits from rapeseed and soybean, although I know that um, uh, opinions again differ. Um, but um, to what extent can olive oil really be scaled up? It's now the production is limited or is, is very strongly concentrated around the Mediterranean where land is scarce so and, and, and yields are low. So can, can we really scale up all of, um, for example, to meet future uh, demands for, for oil? And is that relevant to someone in the, in the Congo who's got less than a dollar to spend? He, he or she is not going to buy extra virgin olive oil at, um, at 10 US dollars a, a bottle because they simply cannot um, afford it. So there are some important considerations, again, between the, the health benefits of certain oils uh, environmental impacts, but also affordability at a local level for the poorest and most undernourished people uh, on our on our planet. Um, and then this whole discussion around the health impacts from saturated fats. I think that's that's changing a lot. Um, the, the, in the past, it used to be all quite simple. Saturated fats were bad for your health and to be avoided. A lot of the review work I've I've recently read seems to seem to change in that, that thinking um, that saturated fats can play a role in our diet um, without negative health impacts. But then I look at it and I look at it from an environmental point of view. Uh, for example, dairy, as I showed with water needs and land needs, has a very high environmental uh, footprint and reduction in dairy intakes would probably be a really good thing in terms of, um, of planetary health. Um, now, what I'm working a lot is, is is looking at the reality. Okay, we are going to meet, um, we're going to need to meet future fat demands. It needs to be produced some somewhere in the world. How can we improve um, the production of these oils and, and fats? Now, I've, I've looked a lot at uh, at oil palm, and as I said, the the big story about oil palm is oil palm is driving uh, a major driver of uh, tropical deforestation. Luckily, in places like in countries like Indonesia. The, the Wild West days seem to be over, where the Wild West days when everyone was grabbing land, everyone was burning land, everyone was speculating on um, on palm oil production. Uh, here you, you're looking at the number of graphs between 2000 and 2019, where you see total oil palm expansion peaking around 2010, 20, 2012. Uh, industrial oil palm expansion is peaking. Smallholder oil palm expansion is peaking in that period. Forest loss in those countries in Indonesia has also peaked and is now at a lower level than it's been for for a long time. And the big question now is: Is this just temporary? Uh, temporarily, is this um, is this the end of oil palm expansion as we know it? And from now on, are we working in more stable systems where we're focusing on improving management of uh, existing oil palm plantation rather than? trying to avoid further expansion of the, the industry. And of course, this is about oil palm, but this is the, just the same in the discussion around soybean and peanuts and cotton and rapeseed, uh, canola and, and sunflower and so on. All these crops are expanding because all of them are needed to meet future oil and fat needs. And reducing that expansion as much as possible and increasing the yields on existing lands is a really important thing to um, to focus on. Okay, I, I promised you about forty five minutes of my uh, my thinking. Um, we we've sort of come to that, and I I really hope I I've managed to to give you some some insights. Um, as as a scientist, we we always tend to say, well, things are really complicated, and um, but then again, there's also uh, it's also really important that we try to to translate things in, in, into something that consumers can actually work with. What are the what are the right uh, the right choices to make? Um, for the time being, if you care about planetary as well as personal health, I don't think there's any clear generalities there. I would say um, don't focus on any particular oil. There's no silver bullet solutions with which you're going to uh, to solve all environmental and um, uh, 
personal uh, uh, health uh, planetary and, and, um, and personal health challenges. Um, so a balanced approach, as long as there is no uh, new highly productive sources of, uh, of animal fats. And I know part of these discussions here about are about um, the use of microbial sources and algae to produce um, fats. And maybe that answers some of these, uh, these questions. For the time being, when I go to the supermarkets, um, <clears throat> I, I would use different oils and different sources of oil. I don't think there's any real winners out there um, that, that really benefit everything yourself and your health and issues like poverty and undernourishment as well as environmental uh, planetary health. Um, so win-wins are not always possible. You're dealing with trade-offs and for that you really need to understand what those tra trade-offs look like um, and how your in individual choices as a consumer influence the outcomes of these, um, these, uh, these trade-offs. I think whatever we do, it's really important that any expansion of oil crops, whether it's for the production of oils directly or it's indirectly to feed animals, needs to be reduced as much as possible. The less we can uh, avoid, uh, the more we can avoid the destruction of, of natural ecosystems, whether they're tropical rainforest or more open savanna types like you have in, in northern Argentina and southern Brazil, or uh, natural grasslands uh, ecosystems like you have in the United States, uh, or even boreal forests in um, in northern Canada and uh, and Russia, we need to really reduce or minimize the negative impacts on these natural environments, whatever we do. And land needs and relative yields per crop are really uh, important. And as scientists, I think we need to get better to get this information in a in a sort of um, um, a manageable way to consumers in a way that people can understand. Uh, feeding black and white pictures to consumers like is happening on social media that generates this polarization where one crop is evil and the other one is wonderful is not particularly helpful, but it's the kind of information consumers pick up and that's why there's strong drives against certain oils and in favor of, of, of other oils. The science simply does not support this kind of polarization. There is no such thing as good and bad oils from an environmental perspective. All oils are basically bad and we need to uh, minimize the overall impacts by choosing the right mixture of different oil producing systems. So with that, I would um, like to, to thank you. Um, if you have any questions, uh, if you agree, uh, please let me know. If you disagree, similarly, please let me know. I'm always happy to uh, discuss you. You can find me online. Uh, my email address is available, email at gmail, uh, dot com. Um, so um, let me know what you think and um, I'll, uh, I'll get back to you. Uh, I hope this was useful.